We are back, and you're listening to the Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Dr. Wilmer Leon, joined here by my co-host, Garland Nixon. Thank you, Wilmer. So the difference between the U.S. and China's response to COVID-19 is staggering. According to Bob Woodward's tapes with the president, the president admitted that the virus was virulent, but he decided to underplay its danger. Quote, I wanted to always play it down because I don't want to create a panic. Meanwhile, in China, ever since the virus was crushed in Wuhan, the government merely has had to contain small-scale localized outbreaks. In the last month, China has had zero domestically transmitted COVID-19 cases. What's the difference between the U.S. and China's response to COVID? Is it as staggering as we think? Well, for insight, we turn to our next guest. He's a frequent collaborator with all major news outlets and author of City Builders and Vandals in Our Age, Caleb Moppin. As always, Caleb, welcome back. Sure. Glad to be here, as always. So while the Trump administration has lied to American citizens and to the world about this disease, China's President Xi Jinping has said that his government would be putting people first. China hastily subordinated its economic priorities to the task of saving the lives lives of Chinese citizens, but China continues to be vilified in mainstream media. Indeed. Um, This narrative that somehow the entire COVID crisis is China's fault, we should blame China for the problems caused by the pandemic, it is repeated uh, by Mike Pompeo, it is repeated by Donald Trump, it is repeated by conservative media and a lot of liberal media. But at the end of the day, just because you say something does not make it true, and just because you say it a number of times does not make it more true. The reality is China faced this COVID crisis before anyone else did. And in response to it, the whole country was put on the same page. Uh, China has many different regions, uh, many different localities. Uh, People in South China and people in North China have a very different view of things. They act very differently. They have very different traditions. Uh, You know, there's, there's many, many different localities, many different industries, many different regions. Now there's a vast market sector in China. I mean, it is the largest country in the world in terms of population. But yet, Despite all of that, the Chinese Communist Party was able to get the entire population and the entire country on the same page and say, look, we've got this situation. We need to lock down certain cities. We need to impose certain restrictions. They did it. Um, They worked with the World Health Organization to spread global awareness, to start producing the necessary protective equipment like masks and gloves and send them across the planet. Um, And they moved ahead. And they, at this point, uh, have got a situation where the movie theaters are open, the country is back to normal, and more importantly, their economy is grinding on ahead. And Chinese media argues that this is the strength of socialism with Chinese characteristics, that the fact that the Chinese Communist Party uh, controls the economy for the benefit of the population, that they don't have a sink or swim free market policies, that they don't let every region just do whatever they feel like doing, Uh, that they have a state central plan and vision. The Chinese Communist Party makes five-year economic plans still. Uh, That This is to credit. Uh, This is where the credit is due uh, for their success in defeating COVID. Now, U.S. media has very conveniently uh, chosen to ignore that. And they have, you know, presented what really are outrageous conspiracy theories. Some right-wing media wants you to believe that COVID is somehow a bioweapon dreamed up in an evil Chinese laboratory Uh, Some right-wing media would have you believe that China conspired to keep the rest of the world from knowing about COVID-19 so they could, you know, make everyone else's economy not work and they could sinisterly plot to take over the world economy. Uh, All of this is, I mean, the worst speculation, the worst conspiracy theory mongering, the worst McCarthyism, the worst uh, paranoia. When you look at the actual data, China got this before anybody else. They swung into motion, um, and meanwhile, here in the United States, where we have a free market economy, our government, our Trump administration, said every state can do whatever they want. Every state is on their own. Trump used the daily briefings that should have been about focusing on how to defeat COVID-19 to uh, pound the podium against Joe Biden and tell everyone that Joe Biden 
was no good. Uh, social unrest expanded. The economy is in a complete mess. Democrats and Republicans continue to quibble about what economic stabilization measures will be put into place. Uh, the Pentagon budget seems to get priorities, uh, while instead of focusing on dealing with the fact that we had an economic catastrophe resulting from the pandemic, our government was busy trying to overthrow the government of Venezuela, trying to escalate tensions with Iran, and we're in a mess, and we continue to be in a mess. I mean, I'm in New York City. Uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're in a situation where uh, finally it looks like, uh, you know, offices and workplaces are opening up. Uh, you know, but it's it's certainly not back to normal, and much of the country is worse off than New York City. And I think this is an argument in China's favor, but U.S. media has conveniently found a way that this is somehow an argument that proves that, uh, that China's evil and out to get us. And it shows, once again, how U.S. media is kind of out of touch with reality and, and, and works very, very hard to craft the minds of Americans to think along the lines of supporting U.S. foreign policy. And a big part of U.S. foreign policy is this trade war that the Trump administration has dreamed up. Uh, Peter Navarro and other hacks in the White House Trade Council have dreamed up this, this, this idea that the way the United States is going to get ahead in the world is by cutting itself off from the fastest growing economy in the world. Uh, and here we are. Uh, it's a mess in, in this country. And rather than learning from China's successes, uh, we are dreaming up conspiracy theories and blaming them for our faults. Well, you know, uh, Caleb, uh, one quick statement, and then, then, then uh, I'll throw it back to you. And that is, even on the Woodward tape, where they, where the the Trump administration has argued that um, the, that China didn't come clean, before uh, Trump talks about how serious COVID is, he starts off by saying he talked to President Xi. Xi. So he starts off by saying that he talked to the Chinese president, and then he goes on to talk about how serious it is. So, so the, his argument that Xi, Xi, Xi never told anyone how serious of it, it, it is falls apart by his own statement. But let me throw this out to you. The way I see it is this. You've got the goose and the golden egg. The goose are the working people, the, the consumers, all of the above. The golden egg would be your, your economic output and how it stabilizes your country. China faced, focused on the goose, figuring if I have the goose healthy, I'll get my golden egg, which is a strong economy. The United States focused on the golden, on the golden egg and let the goose get sick, not even realizing if the goose is sick, you get no golden eggs. At any rate, what are your thoughts on that um, analogy, uh, uh, Caleb? Well, I think you're right. And I think that the big problem we had here during the pandemic is, is that there were two different agendas. Um, you know, whenever you have a capitalist marketplace, you're going to have competing economic entities that are going to want to benefit from whatever crisis or situation is happening in the country. And you'll remember before the explosion that followed the killing of George Floyd, there were already protests going on, but they were right wing protests calling for the opening up of the country. Uh, people marching the signs that said, I want a haircut. People speculating that COVID was all a hoax by the, you know, big giant Illuminati and, you know, the conspiracy and the thing high up on the thing. And uh, those protests were taking place, and there was a big division. And it was pretty clear that what was behind this was that some corporations, like Amazon, like Walmart, uh, were, were really cleaning up and making lots of profits from the fact that the economy was shut down. All their competitors, uh, you know, their stores were closed, uh, but people could still stay home and order online, and people could still, uh, still shop at Walmart, which was deemed essential. And so their competitors were all going out of business, and the monopolies of some already ultra-rich corporations were secured. So they were favoring, you know, keeping the lockdown going for a while. Meanwhile, um, corporations like Hobby Lobby, which are tied to Donald Trump, which had to close down indefinitely, uh, you know, uh, various companies like uh, the fracking companies that were just being squeezed dry by the low oil demand, and the low oil output, they were desperate to have the economy open up once again. And they were, you know, rallying their base, the Tea Partiers, to go out and march, some, in some cases with firearms, to demand that the economy open up. We had voices like Glenn Beck and others on the right wing that were saying, we should just let the older folks die for the sake of keeping the Dow Jones industrial average up. And that the right wing was saying we had to open up as soon as we possibly could. You know, public health, they were not concerned about. So there was this big divide, and it really came down to who was making profits. If you were Jeff Bezos, if you were the Walton family, you favored a long, long lockdown until every competitor went out of business. If you were, if you were Hobby Lobby, if you were the fracking companies, if you were the Koch brothers, uh, you favored you know, immediately opening up. Who cares about public health? 
And the country was divided, and every state was left to do what it wanted, and there was a big divide. And, I mean, it was market chaos. Karl Marx famously used the phrase, the anarchy of production, right? Um, And that's essentially what we had here. We could not get on the same page as a country. Donald Trump couldn't tell his supporters to wear a mask, even though on that very tape that you mentioned with Bob Woodward, he admits that it is airborne, that the virus is spread via air. Right. So why did it take Donald Trump months and months to put a mask on if he was talking to Bob Woodward and admitting that it was spread via air? And why is it that we're to believe this is all a Chinese conspiracy when on that very tape, Donald Trump admits that President Xi gave him accurate information and told him how bad it was? Um, uh, We have seen classic government mishandling of the crisis. Now, the Biden administration is selling themselves as as more managerial uh, more, more able to manage things, uh, more able to handle crises like this. And perhaps they have an argument strongly in their favor. Um, and that seems to be the way they're pitching themselves. But the Trump administration is playing up the idea that the left stands for chaos and violence in the streets. The left stands for tearing down, uh, the, the, you know, the beliefs and the, you know, the good uh, average American, you know, the mythology that, that, you know, many Americans believe and the, the sacred promise and et, et cetera. And it's appealing to social conservatism, running kind of a Richard Nixon, you know, silent majority campaign. So we have a divide now, and we'll see who comes out the winner in the elections. But we should look at this and say that the problem here is that we have a big systemic problem in our country. We are not all on the same page, and that this COVID-19 crisis has really illustrated the flaws, not in one political leader or another, but in our system here. Let me switch gears uh, quickly. We only have about two and a half minutes left Uh, to talk about another issue in terms of what seems to be China bashing. China's academic hits out on Pompeo-backed Xinjiang sterilization report. A Chinese academic has countered U.S.-backed allegations that China is using forced sterilization against Muslims in Xinjiang, saying the claims were based on fabricated facts, and falsified data. In the most detailed response to emerge from China over these findings that U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo described as shocking and disturbing, Xinjiang University Associate Professor Lin Fang Fi said the claims of forced serialization were seriously inconsistent with China's official data. Your thoughts, Kayla Moppin? Well, I think the most damning, you know, thing in the report is the is the birth rate data, right? If there was a policy of forced sterilization, we would see a hugely significant decline in the birth rate among the Uyghur population. We're not seeing that. We're seeing a slight decline in the birth rate, but that's attributed to the fact that women are getting more education, uh, that birth control is more easily accessible among the population, um, and that, you know, in a lot of areas, the, you know, the kind of fundamentalist conservative ideas that were the basis of some of the Uyghur opposition to the Chinese Communist Party have been rolled back. And so women, it's shown that when women have more access to birth control, they have more opportunities to work outside of the home, uh, you know, the, and when, you know, more traditional conservative religious ideas are not as popular, uh, people have children at a, at a slightly lower rate. Um, and, and the numbers in the report don't show what would be going on. If the Chinese Communist Party were going around forcibly sterilizing Uyghur Muslims, we would see a huge drop in the birth rate. We've only seen a slight one, and that can be attributed to cultural changes, uh, not medical ones. Kayla Moppin, as always, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate your analysis. We look forward to having you back. Sure. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. Thank you. Folks, You've been listening to The Critical Hour here on Radio Sputnik. Thank you for allowing our voices into your space. On behalf of myself and my co-host, Garland Nixon, we hope that you were informed and enlightened, and we look forward to talking with you all right here tomorrow on Radio Sputnik. Be safe. Practice physical distancing. Wash your hands. Wear your masks. Just stay at home. And while you're there, listen to Radio Sputnik, and particularly The Critical Hour. Peace and blessings. We're out.